Hi, my name is Eric Nathan. I'm composer in residence of the New England Philharmonic. Hi, I'm Danny Madden. I'm concertmaster of the New England Philharmonic. And we welcome you to Listening In, Deep Dive into the Music with the NEP. It's a series that where we speak to composers and performers about their art and work, but also help our audiences hear this music, um, taking a step behind the scenes, in a sense, to see and hear how the music's made, what's inspired it, how performances of it have come together. And the guests we're featuring on this uh, inaugural season of this Listening In series are all um, guests who we had programmed to um, for the NEP to perform their music and or work with them this year, though um, unfortunately due to COVID and the pandemic, we were we had to cancel our season, but we uh, are looking forward to welcoming these composers and performers next season and that announcement will come in the coming weeks. And so um, during this session, if you're viewing it on YouTube, um, you can sign in to the chat feature and add, ask questions throughout. Um, we will save time at the end for questions that we might uh, answer some as we go along. And so today um, it gives us great pleasure to welcome the composer Diego Rocha, who is the winner of the 2020 uh, NEP Call for Scores. And his winning work, Replie, for orchestra, will be performed by the NEP next season. But today we're going to hear two chamber works that were recently um, performed. Um, and so Diego is currently pursuing a master's degree in composition at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory as a Chancellor's Scholar. And while attending, he has um, studied with Chen Yi, Yotam Haber, Paul Rudry, and Joe Long. And he's worked with numerous ensembles, including Dakota, Loadbang, Bang, String Quartet, Castle of Our Skins, Transient Can Canvas, and others, including Jack Quartet and Public Music, whose music, whose performances we'll hear today. So, welcome, Diego. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. So, um, today we'll be first looking at your recent String Quartet, Standing Waves. And this is your third string quartet. So I'm curious, um, how has the string quartet played a, a role in your life as a composer? I know you're a trombonist, and what's been your relation with string instruments? Um, I, I have relatively little playing experience. I did uh, methods in my undergraduate degree because I was a music education major for a while. And that's about the complete extent of my playing experience on strings. I can play a few tunes. Um, but actually, the, my first string quartet, which is titled Anxiety, was kind of my first real piece, quote unquote. Um, so it's actually kind of been an important part of my work as a composer, basically the entire time I've been a composer. Um, so it's interesting, it was interesting to come back to it a few years later with a little bit more experience and kind of some things are similar, some things are different. So Diego, uh, tonight we'll be listening to uh, excerpts from this third string quartet that you wrote, Standing Waves is the title. And um, the title of this, uh, we're wondering, it's, it seems to have meaning for you beyond its meaning uh, in acoustic science. Because in your program note, you mentioned that standing waves, there's something about them as a phenomenon that it has a certain longingness to it. Uh, so could you talk a little about what the definition of a standing wave is maybe in science and also yeah. about its meaning to you in this piece? Yeah, um, so standing waves essentially are when an object is moving up and down, but the particles themselves are basically staying in the same horizontal space, but it looks like the wave itself is moving along, but everything is actually in the same place and just moving up and down, um, which is actually the form that uh, sound takes. It's kind of uh, compressing and decompressing air, but the air itself is basically staying in the same place. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting for me, that quality of looking like it's moving, but not actually changing. Um, and that reminded me of the kind of idea of like ostinati within music, where it's this pattern that's happening, but 
in kind of the grand scheme of the piece, it's a point of staticness where nothing is actually changing in those parts, um, which kind of inspired the opening. Well, the opening inspired the title more. The title came later. Oh, that's so interesting. So the, the element of longingness is that it appears to be moving, yet it's not? Yeah, it's this kind of um, just a sense of like feeling like you're pulling away. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, well, let's talk about, even though uh, we're not going to listen to the entire first movement, the beginning is so uh, evocative. Uh, you have a, speaking of ostinati, uh, repeated patterns in uh, the lower strings in this opening, um, sort of halting, uh, staggered low notes playing almost like a, it's almost like a Barcarolle rhythm, almost a six, eight Venetian gondolier, but it's seven, eight. So it's yeah. very undulating. And I found that was a fascinating way to spend the first uh, seven bars of the piece, I think, is it seven? Yeah, just gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, is that, am I on the right track here with the repeated? Uh, yeah, I, it, it, it was to me, um... I don't know, it's somewhat evocative of the idea of water. In general, I don't, I tend to apply like extra musical connections afterwards. It's like I write the music and then I'm like, oh, this reminds me of this thing. Um, but I mean, there's some idea of that in mind and just kind of the f sense of feeling like you're in a single place and that you're kind of static in that moment. And then right at um, letter A, you introduce uh, a theme that is starts out very high in the first violin and falls down and has within it at the very end of it, its own echo, uh, sort of a major sixth uh, in 10 that is echoed. Then it's followed uh, right away in the second by a rising theme. That rising theme goes right up to the top note of the the uh, first yeah. five theme, so um, that's that continues for about twenty two bars. Um, it's very wave like, uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about uh, those themes. So, in terms of my own thinking, they basically form part of the same theme. It's just like the rising line is just not part of it the first time. It's a kind of stark introduction on the A, which is the highest note that you see at uh, rehearsal A there. Um, and setting up this idea of D minor that is somewhat... Um, uh, unsettled by the A flats. Um, especially because the first note is A and the special importance is placed on that and then having the A flats happen at the same time under it. Um, so it was kind of this idea of rocking back and forth and going kind of up and down within this somewhat limited pitch set and the echoes um, and how the lower notes like the echoes, especially later on as kind of more layers are added to it, um, fall into the ostinati as well, and it kind of all becomes jumbled together a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, Danny. Oh, go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just wanted to jump off of the term ostinati, which uh, Diego mentioned before, is this repeated pattern. Um, you could see that here in the cello, and that perhaps an ostinati, this cello is the cello part, the viola part, the viola, violin two, and the violin one, if you've not read a score before, but here this cello keeps coming in on the beginning of every measure here. And then we have the viola, which then comes in on the second beat of every measure. So there becomes this repeated pattern, and then the violin two comes in on the third beat of every bar, and it's starting to create this undulating groove almost underneath of it. But here, because there's seven beats in the measure, we don't ever quite feel it as being something we can really tap our foot to. It always keeps coming at a slightly unexpected moment, like the water sloshing waves or in a, in a lake or something. Um, so it's just, just saying that. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we 
uh, take a listen to this and then um, chat a little bit more. So here's the opening of the string quartet performed by the Jack Quartet. Beautiful. It's a, a hypnotic opening. Um, the repeated patterns in the lower strings just uh, really set a mood of of quiet. And then these melodies in the high in the violins and then viola just falling and rising, falling and rising, and falling and rising, sort of around like a. Yeah like a standing wave, I guess. <laughs> Was that sort of what, what you were thinking or did that come afterwards? Um, the specific connection with standing waves as kind of a thing came later on. Um, I the, the title and kind of idea of that um, is something that I came up with about halfway through writing the first movement, which I wrote before the second movement. Um, Originally, this piece was like three different drafts that were completely different music, and then I was like choosing which one I wanted to actually make into a full piece. Um, so they were kind of all just ideas of openings, basically, and materials. This one was just beautiful. And then after this opening, there's sort of a bridge section of almost <laughs> bony, bony sounds of pizzicato and and so forth when uh, you bring in the tune La Sandunga in the second violin. I wonder um, if Eric could play that tune for us uh, on his piano and we'll have a listen to it. Sure. And underneath this tune, uh, Diego, you put almost the sound of a broken guitar, sort of a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, sort of uh, almost uh, almost an inaccurate sound, as if the guitarist is just barely hanging on. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us about the, your beautiful quote of La Sanduga and what does the song mean and why do you use it in this context um yeah so regarding just the accompaniment um and kind of setting the song as an idea um the, the song itself is a waltz and traditionally that has an accent on the two um which is kind of what's being played at here um for those who are just watching the viola the third staff down are actually doing pizzicato behind the bridge. It's this very kind of uh, high-pitched percussive sound. Um, 
that's almost kind of like sticks um, rather than like specific pitch. Um, so it's this kind of percussive element to go with the more pitched element of the uh, just left hand pizzicato of the cello, which is strong pitch aligned with the sustained note. Um, the tune itself is um, a Mexican folk song. It's uh, kind of more specifically quite well known in the Oaxacan region, which is like the southern Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and Sandunga itself is a very uncommon Spanish word that's kind of like um, gracefulness, wit, um, elegance, that kind of idea. Um, and the song is, I mean, there's a few interpretations. The lyrics themselves just say, a woman of my heart. Um, and some interpretations take that as like a mother and some interpretations take it as a lover. Um, I don't have an especially strong preference, honestly. Um, but essentially, the, this woman has died and the person is knocking at their door, trying to find them and sees them as a ghost. So it's this kind of um, haunting, uh, slightly strange song in reverence of this person um, and their gracefulness and wit and elegance and charm. Um, beautiful it it does sound mournful in this setting and uh it's it's just beautifully set uh eric shall we have a listen sure so we're going to start a few measures before this begins and you can hear the um the, the sounds underneath starts to set the scene before the the second violin comes in here with the melody So you can hear in that underneath also this ostinato repeated pattern, this under, undulating rhythm underneath of this too, um, an echo of some sort from the beginning. So we, we would like to move on to the second movement. And as Danny and I were taking a look at this, um, we wondered if the Sandunga theme comes back again, and particularly here, this section really feels like a very tenuous um, texture, almost ghostly in the these um, tremolos here that we have underneath this soaring melody above, which we thought reminded us of the descent that we have in that Sandunga theme. Uh, also, there's a, a, a some a somewhat similar lamenting quality in it. So I um, was curious if the, if the, if you saw it this way or or how does this um, melody function in the second movement here that we see here. Oh, you're still muted. Yeah. I didn't consider it as a direct connection, although I can definitely see the connection, just kind of looking at it. There are some elements that are, of it that are quite similar. Um, what I was actually thinking of more, and this gets into fun, just like direct kind of musical things is about this kind of chromatic descent that happens and is displaced. But that's kind mm -hmm. of the fun things that composers tend to do instead of like <laughs> more uh, extra musical connections. Um, and the way that that connects also with the violin too and cello and their tremolos, which are also chromatically descending. Right, so the lower we, pitches of them. We see here this descent of an F going to an E flat, going to a D, to a C sharp, 
to a C natural to a B. Yeah, I should say semi-chromatic. No, it's not full chromatic. Then there are these notes that are not quite in that in the order of chromatic going down of. Uh, A little bit of displacement of our descent as we continue down, but a beautiful descending line. And I guess you're saying back here too, we have a, every note is slightly lower. Come below that happened beneath it. Yeah. Um, and then also the uh, viola is echoing in octave. Oh, well, sometimes echoing, sometimes. Uh, being a little bit earlier, but kind of doing a slightly rhythmically modified version of it an octave lower as well. Yeah, you can see this same note is here an octave lower, and they're just displaced by a 16th note. So there's, it's almost like there's a, a, an echo happening here, too. Um, well, let's take a listen to this. So in this piece, um, in this movement, we're going to show you a few sections so you can keep this in mind is returns again and it's uh, a very uh, evocative texture you hear. And then later we get this same tune again, that descending, that rising melody that then descends uh, with the chromatic motion, with the little leaps that happen, oops, little leaps that happen underneath. Um, but here it's just unaccompanied in, in harmonics, which is a, a way that the violinist can press down the lowest pitch here and touch the top pitch very lightly with their usually they're pinky, um, and that makes this lower pitch sound up two octaves. So you get a very, very high, ethereal, wispy sound here. So taking this into an even more ethereal realm. So what you just heard is a reprise of the opening texture, which this piece, there's, there's really a great contrast between these very intimate, um, delicate textures and then a more dense um, intensity. So here you open with this dense texture. It's really a turbulent um, passage of quick notes that we see at the beginning. And you then have this interesting notation down here um, where you put these phrases in boxes. and in essence, this is telling the, each player to take what's in the box and then just repeat it until they get to the next figure and you repeat it for five seconds and then you repeat this figure here for 20 seconds. And you're saying gradually accelerate and slow down independently unsynchronized. So the players start to, they begin together and then they, they morph out of phase until I hear they're just all going for 45 seconds at their own pace. And underneath of this, it's really a beautiful lyrical line in the viola where you've removed the stem. Some, you see mainly you have a, a note that might have this stem here that shows its duration. But here there are no stems on these pitches, which gives the violist a uh, license to pick the rhythms that they perform. Um, so curious here about um, your concept and also using both musical notation, but also a sense of freedom that you're giving to a player. And what's that play here for you? Yeah, um, with this section, it was important to me to kind of like the the beginning, very beginning is almost kind of machine like in how it works together, and it's very everything is kind of centered on these downbeats that are hit together. And then in between them, there's kind of this chaos of the polyrhythms where everyone's playing different amounts of notes. Um, and then how those 
themselves fall apart so then you kind of just have different layerings of this kind of chaotic thing um that kind of just fade into the background and then you are given something to focus on with the melody and kind of with the free nature of the accompaniment i think it's a really great opportunity for the violas to also be free in their rhythm because there is no other like thing that they have to organize around or kind of like uh bend to in terms of rhythmic steam and then right after this section uh is comes a section that i particularly love uh it's one where you give each member of the quartet a soloistic uh, what amounts to almost a cadenza um each player starts independently of their neighbors the cello starts uh, violin one waits eight seconds and comes in with the identical it looks like identical um figures that the cello is playing then 16 seconds later the viola is in and then even later comes the second violin who is um, just transposed down it looks like a fourth to me um yeah so can you talk to us about uh, this passage and its incredible uh vehement mood <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, I saw actually a similar kind of idea in a string quartet by Derek Vermel, actually, um, of this kind of like independent solos, essentially. Um, and I was interested in how that would function within a canon specifically where it's the same materials, um, and you can kind of like then re-identify materials, especially in the latter half of all of um the solos there's this kind of like descending lines that da 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 um that create these just kind of generic descending patterns that repeat and how those would fit together especially because um i i think it comes across but there's a sense of like harmonic descent throughout despite the fact that it's essentially static um and so this canon is like a, um, it's like a round, like a row, row, row your boat. Though here, quite an unsynchronized um, <laughs> version <laughs> of, of a round. Um, let's take a listen to these first two pages here before we listen to the full movement. So before we um, get into this, um, Diego, um, we were wondering anything else you'd like to tell us before we listen to it. Um, is there a, a narrative that you had in mind for this, or is it uh, is it more abstract music? And just should we follow the um, these different textures that we've been discussing? Um, in the second movement, it's um, pretty abstract. Um, it's kind of following in this idea of like neo-romantic lyricism 
um, kind of like, I don't know, an idea of romantic music, but with a lot of extended techniques and uh, without tonality either. Um, it was kind of inspired by some ideas of that and kind of taking inspiration from that. Real, real intense expressivity. Yeah, okay, well, let's take a listen to the second movement of Standing Waves.
Beautiful. Thank Very you. beautiful. Just gorgeous. Yes, so um, we wanted to move on to um, Scenes of Night, um, which you composed to perform um, just this spring by Hubble Music. And um, in this, um, in the program note, you mentioned there are uh, different scenes that you're uh, in, sort of the inspiration, um, such as a drunk walking down the street, um, um, image uh, sites that kind of go quickly by one's uh, field of vision, which I thought maybe could be like cars passing. There's there are unique textures that evoke these types of um, scenes, and then there's one that's a very static, cold night that we perhaps hear distant night sounds, and there's more angular, aggressive moments. And um, when we were discussing this, we were uh, Nanny and I were thinking of this idea of a continuum between and pushing and pulling between areas of unity and that of the vision of the players, but also areas of where there's a lot of motion and areas where there's stillness. And it seems to be tugging back and forth um, in different stages of, of how far we are on one side of the continuum to the other. So I was wondering how you conceptually thought about this piece, both with in the terms of the inspiration, but if any of these ideas of stasis and activity, unison playing, divided playing, um, came into your mind at all? Um, yeah, absolutely. So actually, kind of the main musical idea for me in this was the kind of the rhythmic play of it and this idea of time dilation. So feeling like you're speeding up and slowing down. And in some cases, we are literally speeding up and slowing down. The tempo is changing. Um, and in some cases, it's kind of an effect within one tempo. Um, so the kind of rhythm rhythm of like coming in and out of sync with each other and slowing down and speeding up was very important to me in kind of conceptualizing the piece. And so, uh, oh, sorry, Danny, please. Oh, go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, as a listener, um, I, I got the sense listening to this piece that you were, it was almost like a travelogue, as if you were walking through a town at night, and here's the block with the bar on it, and here's the block with it's a really quiet pond you're passing by. Was there, you know, to me, it felt like I was, I was traveling somewhere in the sound with you. And plus certain sections like the bar section keeps yeah. coming back. So did you have that sense when you were composing it? Um, not necessarily a narrative in the kind of like attached to reality sense. Obviously the kind of like um, narrative sense of a listener of like, you know, how things fit together obviously plays a part. That is what form is as like a narrative sense, be it made out of like harmonic progressions or materials or whatever. Um, so I, and I mean, I actively encourage people to imagine scenes as related to it, it is called scenes of night. Um, so I think it's perfectly fine to do that. Um, it just necessarily wasn't necessarily something that was in my mind. It's kind of just more attached to the materials themselves. I'm usually, um, Although I do actually have a note that says stumbling drunkenly, but that's kind of more of a musical note that <laughs> as well. Um, so, I mean, there is some of that in mind, but it's mostly kind of centered around the materials for me, but I'm sure that the materials themselves can inspire various ideas about what might be happening. We wondered if you might take us through, um, like behind the scenes here, taking a look at the very opening of this piece and how does inspiration get translated into music? How did you approach starting to think about the first page of music here? Yeah, so as I mentioned, this idea of time dilation and changing was really important to me. Um, and actually kind of one of the first ideas I had is if you see the cello line at the on the second system there starting measure nine this uh trill that slows down figure um that was one of the first ideas i had was this idea of trills that are speeding up and slowing down kind of independently of each other which 
ultimately ended up being kind of a very difficult thing to manage and perform. So I kind of strapped that idea, but there's still elements of that original conception. Um, but in favor of um, instead uh, retardandos, which are slowing downs, and accelerandos, which are speeding up um, of the ensemble kind of in sync with each other and then using elements like, sorry, there's some very loud tats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then having some elements of that be independent like in the flute part as well which has rhythm that speeds up as it goes on um, in terms of the pitch so this is actually a, a serial piece which is, means that it's based on a row which you can see in the flute part um, which basically means that it goes to the 12 standard like um equal temperament notes and uses only one of each um this isn't something that i do often in my work and a big part of the reason why i did it is because it kind of it makes it easier to manage pitch than in like a freely atonal setting um where you kind of generally have to think about it more um so specifically because pitch wasn't really a focus for me but the rhythm was more of a focus for me that I ended up kind of doing this uh, more esoteric way of kind of organizing pitch, um, which kind of can make it fun, even if you don't really care that much about the specific pitches. Um, to talk yeah. about this opening specifically, this kind of like the idea of um, games. Um, so the uh opening four notes this kind of opening harmony from which the voices then disperse is actually the first four notes of the row so the flute starts on g and obviously that line begins on g then the second note of that line is c which is the note that the clarinet has it looks like an e flat but it's clarinet and a um so it's actually a minor third lower so that's a, a concert c natural and then G sharp, which is the opening note of the cello, just written enharmonically to A flat. And then C sharp, which is the opening note of the violin. And then from there, all the instruments play their version of the row with the flute and the violin playing it in the standard way and the clarinet and cello playing it upside down, uh, what we call inversion. Um, and then that happens for two measures. And then in the second two measures, measures three and four, it just reverses. Um, so instead the clarinet plays what we would call the retrograde of it. And the clarinets and the, sorry, the clarinet and cello play what we call the retrograde inversion, which just means that it's backwards and upside down instead of right side up and forward. Yeah, so just a brief little lesson to the audience on 12 tone music, serial music. So if you take, as Diego said, the 12 equal tempered pitches of a chromatic scale, we could hear 12 pitches here. So that's, we have 12 pitches and those are the notes that make up, we can hear it in a lot of music, including tonal music. You, you might get through all those with different chord changes and key changes in the piece. But here you can see, um, that if you look at the flute part here, you might even, I think, do you, you have a full row here as well, right? Uh, all of the parts also, do. Yes. Yeah. So all of the parts we, have full rows on every two measures here. So I numbered up here one through 12. So if we look at this flute part, the first note, So by the time we get to this last pitch, none of the previous pitches have repeated yet. So every new pitch is a new pitch we haven't heard before. And by the time we get here, the next pitch we hear is one that we haven't heard since the beginning. And so this does give a sense of order to this music in that not there's no one pitch that's being given primacy here in centricity. Um, um, well, I think is also pretty cool about this too. He was mentioning retrogrades and inversions. If you actually look at this first um, bit here, and then you look at this next bit here, you can see that this is actually a mirror image of the first two bars, and it's just up a half step. So you can see this note goes down by this interval. This one goes down by this. 
interval, and we have the same pattern of intervals going back and forward. So there's, it's like there's a mirror right here, and as he was saying too, when this note, this instrument goes up, this one goes down, goes up, goes down, and so they're also a mirror. Lots of mirrors um, happening all over the place here, and creates um, quite a fun uh, ex excavation for any uh, person studying this this piece. Um, an element that we found was also really interesting is that on the next page, um, sorry, um, here you mentioned stumbling drunkenly um, in the violin part. And so this made us think about this opening where we have these three longer, um, three longer pitches um, followed by a, a quick version of three pitches. So this in a triplet form it almost felt like someone's stumbling um, being drunk in a sense, um, uh, one long step, one short step. Um, so we thought we could take a listen to this opening where you hear this pushing and pulling of time, these mirror images of pitch, and then these, the, we felt maybe this is like some, something zooming past, um, um, like a car, and then on the next page here, this drunken stumbling, and then it, I love this description for the other three players, um, glare at the violinist until they stop playing. So there's a theatricality here of the physical gesture, which we won't unfortunately be able to hear um, necessarily sonically, but we could imagine um, this happening as the, uh, the, the violinist aggressively rants on a very low G, their lowest note that they can play. So let's take a listen to this opening. quite a rant in the violin. Um, the repeated downbow gestures that make it sound so uh, emphatic and just so out of control. Uh, we're wondering, did this come from a personal experience or uh, do you know a violinist who rants like that? Or <laughs> uh, No. I, I, any violinist friends of mine watching? No, I, I don't. <laughs> But it's, it's very effective as a, you know, when, when a violinist is doing that, if we have yeah. the pri privilege to be in the room together, right, it's, it's such a theatrical look. Um, and it was, it was a wonderful moment there. Um, I, we were, Eric and I were wondering about gesture in music and how that might play a role in your music. Yeah, um, especially in this section specifically speaking about the like stumbling drunkenly a large part of kind of these rhythms isn't so much for the like sound of it because I, I mean they just like you can't actually like make out like oh this is the third beat of this septuplet like um but it's for kind of the theatricality of being very disorganized from each other and then in the sound as well um and you'll notice looking at the store that it has a lot of bow markings and a lot of very strong dynamic changes and a lot of that is just to kind of like get at the sense of like really um being unstable or unstable i should say um and having the cellist kind of uh going along with it while the violinist is going a little bit crazy above them 
um, and then missing their cue for the end of the section and just keeping going with it a bit too long. Because right here at the end, you this marking, I get rid of some of the, uh, this marking here um, means the violinist should play with a down bow where they come up, down versus the up bow, which is here. And so you've, you've written a theatricality even into the part here where the violinist has to physically retake their bow to play down bow again instead of going down, up, down, up. So there's this violent um, kind of hitting motion that, that happens here that I, that, that could also be eye catching too, not just um, you've given the players the instruction to glare as well, but we, we may be drawn to that physical motion as well. Um, so before we take a listen to this, we thought um, what we might do is just play a few of these other textures that we found to be um, quite unique um, for us, for audiences to keep in mind as they hear these different scenes. And so this one here, there's this element of the long and short that we have beginning, the kind of long value versus a more compressed um, music here. But here everybody is playing um, in the same rhythms as one another, all at the same time, like we had at the beginning, but here there's, it gets even more aggressive um, with the faster note values here with these um, 16th notes. Um, so we'll take a listen to this. And then on this page here, there element that we thought almost like a, a Doppler effect or a car zooming past and that we have, again, a, a canon canonical effect where we have one instrument and then the next instrument begins the same six note phrase, but just a little bit behind the other one. And so it kind of like zooming, zooming past us. And then here um, in this section, there's a, a beautiful wispy texture. Um, and we were wondering if you could ha describe the influence of, of this and a new technique here to ask the flute to be performing. Yeah, so um, this specific technique with the flute, um, to describe it kind of loosely is uh, flutes actually have an open mouthpiece where they blow air over their uh, tone hole and then it's actually like the edge of that and the air catching that and then spinning inside of the flute that creates the tone. Um, but because of the fact that it's an open kind of air hole, flautists can actually move somewhat smoothly between blowing air completely outside of it and just having it be like just the sound of like breathing. Um, and more strong tone of flute playing. Um, that's especially true in the lower range. As it gets higher up, you kind of lose a sense of that. Um, and I mentioned that it's more for um, the feeling of going upwards, and obviously at some point the pitch can't continue going upwards. Um, but then having that be echoed in the strings, which are actually quite good at making sound effects that are similar to that, um, through like sol, ponticello, and soltasto playing, both kind of uh, lower the sense of pitch. In this case, it's sol, ponticello. So you get um, more of high harmonics. So there's the fundamental pitch, and then there's the harmonics that are kind of resultant from that and part of that sound. And when you play sol, ponticello, there's more emphasis on the higher ones. And when you play really softly, and it's kind of this chromatic thing, um, it ends up kind of being like noise because it's very mixed signals all over the place, which actually makes it very similar to the sound of uh, like breath, um, which is also kind of high pitched noise. So they kind of come together. Yeah, and the sol ponticello and soltasto techniques are the the violinist um, or string player will take 
on their bow and just bow in a slightly different place than they normally do. So if they normally bow here, and then they might be Soltantatello closer to where the bridge is or Soltasta closer to where the fingerboard begins, the, where they play all the notes higher up. Um, and that really changes the timbre and sound color of, of the music. So here I think is a beautiful, um, beautiful combination of, of like timbres um, between these, these very different sounding instruments. So that more nasally sound is the in the strings is the salpanticello effect. And um, Danny, I know you had some things you wanted to, to mention about this last page too. Oh yeah, um, at 168, 169, uh, it's a very quiet, quiet episode. Um, we're looking at just a long note in the cello. And then these punctuations from the clarinet uh, that look and sound like just pushing air, just gusts of air. And then little pizzicato notes in the flute, which yep. on a string instrument, it's just pluck. But uh, on the flute, it's very effective. Um, so it sounds very bony and icy here. Can you talk about this a, a minute? or? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so here it's um, kind of something that I was thinking about was this idea of layers. So the um, kind of pitches that are being used are spread very far apart with the flute and clarinet kind of being grouped together a bit when the clarinet is doing more pitched things. But then the cello is in its very lowest register playing completely below the staff. Um, while the violin is doing harmonics like we heard a lot in the string quartet, um, quite a bit above so it creates this kind of like big space that's being taken up but there's a huge kind of gap in the middle that can be filled in um and gives it kind of a hollow effect and especially with the this effect on the flute um the pitch is very um it's very unharmonic rich there's very little harmonics it's almost completely just the fundamental um as well with the clarinet with the slap ton um, that I think kind of further emphasizes that emptiness that's taking place in between these like, you know, four octave gap between the violin and cello. Thank you. Let's hear this texture. So we'll have a chance to hear that in just a second. So we thought um, this piece is about 10 minutes. We're going to play the full piece for you all, and then we will resume and come back with questions. So if you have any questions, um, think of them, and you can put them in the chat, and we'll get to these at the end of the session today. So here is Scenes of Night.
Bravo. Bravo, Diego. Thank you. It looks like we have a few questions um, from the chat. I'm curious to know how the musicians you've composed for have influenced your composition practice. Um, yeah, absolutely. The musicians often have uh, a very strong influence on kind of what I write um, when I have the opportunity to know who I'm writing for, um, which I prefer. It's always very nice to kind of know who you're writing pieces for and what specific players will be doing the premiere. Um, to take these two pieces as examples, I had mentioned with the string quartet that it originally was three very different drafts that were all like a minute or two minutes each. Um, and I was working with a string quartet and composing it and kind of had, had them workshop all of them. Um, and I went to a concert with the, uh, that they were performing in, and I was really struck by their lyrical playing. And I kind of was like, that's the draft that I should do. This is like the one that has the lyrical playing and I think will fit them best. Um, so in that case, like hearing them play was kind of the deciding factor of like which kind of route the piece would go. And it would have been a very, very, very different piece. Otherwise, the other two were quite different. One of them was a kind of very aggressive rhythmic kind of um, thing. And the other one was um, more of a um, kind of experimental one, I'll say. Uh, it's kind of hard to describe in words without the kind of sound of it. Um, and in the case of the hub piece, um, I, I had known that I was that Hub Quartet would be playing it, um, so I listened to a bunch of their recordings, and I was kind of really struck by the like vitality and the like vigor of their playing. Um, they they kind of really go at things, so I wanted a piece that could like really exploit that with like the unison sections that are you know for TCMO and together, um, as well as I mean show their ability in extended techniques, which they're quite skilled at, um, and kind of the color possibilities of that, especially in contrast to this more traditional and aggressive playing that happens in some of the sections. Um, and I mean, that degree, or that process happens to some degree with every piece, even if I don't know who I'm specifically writing it for, there kind of becomes this idea of like an imagined performer and what you kind of imagine this person sounding like and what they do. And then you can kind of try to find people that match or have similarities to that in some way when you're looking for performers. Because often the people who you like are like, I think this piece would be a good fit for them. Also generally feel like that piece would be a good fit for them because you're kind of approaching the same ideas with it. I find it to be always an interesting experience um, hearing uh, work performed by other performers after I've heard it performed by <laughs> certain group of performers. And I, the piece feels like it grows too on its own by um, how different people interpret it in different ways and there are different sensibilities they bring to it. Yeah, the string quartet is going to be played um, this summer by the Arditi Quartet, actually, which I'm very excited about. And I'm looking forward to see how it's different. I, I both Jack and Arditi are quartets that I very much admire, and I think they play great, but they also play differently. So I'm curious to see what different things they do, especially in the second movement where there's kind of even more freedom in the direct sense beyond just like kind of in how you approach musicality, but also just like in how you approach the structure of it. Right. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to hearing that too. Um, another question from the chat, how does your background as a trombone player influence your compositions? Um, it, I'm not completely sure. Uh, it, uh, kind of facetious answer is that I tend to use flats a lot more than sharps, but, and sometimes string players don't love that. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've gotten better about that. Um, I think kind of one of the ways is that I, when I'm writing lines, I tend more towards, um, lyrical lines rather than kind of like, I don't know, the idea of these like 
lines where you have the basic uh, kind of idea of the melody where you're going from like A to C to D or whatever. And then kind of in between that are these like little virtuosic flurries um, that are kind of very normal, like classical music and are, you know, quite easy to do on like flute or violin. Um, but those aren't really lines that I ever did. Um, and I mean, sometimes I do things like that, but for the most part, I tend to do for melodic lines, at least things that are kind of more singable, a little bit more straightforward, even if rhythmically they might be a little wonky. Just for the, the, the ease of the physicality of playing on the trombone, easier to play we have to move yeah. the slide in and out first a single simple melody versus all the movements yeah that that, that those things aren't fun to do on trombone they're yeah. rather uh uncomfortable no I, I found also um like you were saying earlier you learned to play some of the string instruments i've I found learning to play other instruments really helpful in getting a sense of the physicality of that i, I brought it i play the trumpet but i bought a trombone to write a trombone piece and it was really quite interesting to to experience the moving the slide positions and that gave me some new ideas that way yeah it's um, it, it's kind of a very different experience from any other wind or brass instrument i was fortunate in that i you know went through the full methods cycle in undergraduate so i have at least a little bit of experience on almost every instrument, even the ones that I don't really play. Um, and certainly there's like groups of things that are pretty similar, you know, like violin and viola feel quite similar to play for the most part. Um, but trombone is a very different feeling instrument to play than any other instrument. There's not really a similar thing to it, um, which I suppose gives somewhat of a unique perspective. Um, Although it's hard for me to say how much it's influenced me because I don't know what I would have written if I hadn't played trombone either. Yeah. Um, looks like we have one more question. When it comes to submitting a work to a competition like the NEP's call for scores, how do you decide what work to submit? That's a complicated question and depends on a lot. Um, so in some cases, just the circumstances of the submission will necessitate that you submit one specific piece. For example, the NEP call for scores was for orchestral pieces. So that limits down what I can submit a lot. Um, but in other things, there's kind of more open submissions where you might be able to submit a piece for any instrumentation, um, especially in competitions, like the kind of competitions that ASCAP, which is a music rights organization, or BMI, which is similar, um, run, where there'll be these open instrumentation things. But for call for scores, generally you're given an instrumentation. Um, and in that case, then you're working from a very small range of pieces. Usually most people don't have more than like five pieces that are like the exact same instrumentation or kind of similar things where they could be like submitted for things. Um, so that helps narrow down the process a lot. Beyond that, it's um, listening to the other pieces that an ensemble has played in a call for stories, for example, and getting a sense of the kind of music that they like. For example, if I listen and it's mostly traditional music with some kind of like modernist things mixed in, I probably wouldn't send a piece that's filled with extended techniques because um, I just won't choose it. Even if I think it's a good piece and they think it's a good piece, they probably will choose it in favor of something that's more close to, closely related to what they normally do. Um, and I mean, a similar thing happens um, in cases where you know what the panel will be. Um, you can listen to the music of the panel and panels try to be impartial about who they select in terms of stylistic and aesthetic relation. Um, but generally people are better able to kind of understand and get a sense of music that at least has some connections to their own, even if they're not trying to be biased to it, they're just more likely to kind of understand what's happening and relate to it. Um, so that's part of it, I suppose. It's always a uh, having applied to many th competitions and call for scores myself. It's always a 
difficult process and you can kind of psych yourself out too much by trying to second guess in, in the end yeah. what, you, what you feel strongly, most strongly about as a composer, I yeah. think. But, um, a lot of times it ends up being somewhat of a kind of spur of the moment decision. I see something and like I feel like submitting this piece for it or uh, sometimes it, it's just like you have this piece that you really like and it hasn't been performed yet. And so you're biased towards submitting that because that's the piece that needs a performance and the other ones have performances. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. But overthinking it is definitely a thing. You certainly don't want to overthink it to the point where you don't submit anything. Because uh, that's a little useless. Well, on the note of um, submitting a piece that to get to performance, I think Replie, which will perform next year, will that be the premiere? Uh, yes, it will be the premiere. Great. So we'll look forward to the world premiere of Replie next season. Um, and I thought we could uh, just want to wrap up and say I want to thank everyone here for joining us tonight. And if you've enjoyed this program, please consider making a donation to the NEP for to support future events like this. Your contribution goes completely to the programming for our season, and your support is greatly appreciated. Um, you can make a donation to the link in the bio below. And stay tuned for upcoming events from the NEP, um, including the announcement of our 21-22 season. You can also visit the NEP's website for all latest information about upcoming programs at nephilharmonic.org. So thank you all. Thank you, Diego, for joining us, and good night. Thank you, Diego. Good night, thank everyone. Thank you for having me. Good night. Good night.